Hello everyone, I'm Betty, and I'd like to open up about a significant chapter of my life involving some intense challenges with my in-laws and my husband amidst navigating a divorce. I thought sharing this might resonate with those of you who have faced undue criticism from your in-laws. Let's go back to where it all started. I met Kevin, my now estranged husband, on a dating app when I was a 20-year-old college student. Kevin was 26, employed, and stable. Despite our age difference, we fell in love. I've always believed that love isn't bound by age or looks, so Kevin being older was never an issue for me. However, Kevin was troubled by our age gap. He would often ask, Why are you with me, Betty? You could find someone your age who might be a better match. But I chose him because I loved him, and for me, age was just a number. Kevin's insecurities were deep-rooted. He would persist. There must be other reasons, Betty. It's not usual for someone like you to love someone like me. I wish you'd just tell me the real reason. I reassured him repeatedly that my feelings were genuine. I wasn't interested in dating someone my age. I loved him, and that was what mattered to me. Despite my assurances, Kevin's self-doubt lingered, hinting at deeper self-esteem issues that seemed to have kept him single before we met. Eager to prove my genuine affection, I made it a point never to let Kevin spend excessively on me. While I was a college student managing my finances, I wasn't wealthy but made sure to buy him thoughtful gifts and handle my expenses. I always worked part-time jobs, ensuring I wasn't financially dependent on him. Kevin seemed to appreciate these efforts, but sadly, his insecurities didn't fade and he continued to question the sincerity of my love, which deeply hurt me. It took three years before I fully understood the origins of Kevin's issues when I met his parents, Samuel and Charlotte. Samuel, Kevin's father, had a turn of fortune when he won the lottery, which dramatically changed their lives. This background gave me insight into the environment that shaped Kevin's perspectives and insecurities. After they won the lottery, Samuel and Charlotte bought a lavish house and wisely invested the rest of their winnings. Yet, their newfound wealth seemed to come with a sense of superiority. During our first meeting, Samuel often bragged, saying, Not everyone makes it big like me. I was just a hard worker and look where it got me. Do you realize how rare it is to win big in the lottery? Yet, I managed it on my first try. They were quite proud of their decision-making skills, often implying that Kevin, despite his college education, would never reach their level of financial success. Charlotte often suggested that Kevin's previous partners were only after his money, leaving him as soon as they were financially better off. They openly doubted Kevin's ability to make good decisions, which infuriated me. It seemed like Kevin's parents were painting every woman he dated as a gold digger. And over time, Kevin began to believe this narrative himself. This insinuation that I was just another gold digger became an embarrassing and hurtful part of their narrative. Fed up with their baseless assumptions, I stood up for both Kevin and myself. I'm sorry, but I have to disagree with you. Kevin has worked hard to establish his career, and in time he will achieve even greater success. But Samuel retorted, Well, that doesn't change the fact that women only want him for money. The money we have is ours, but Kevin does co-own the house. Eventually, it will be his. Every time these girls see our $350,000 house, I swear they just see dollar signs. I couldn't hold back. I can't speak for Kevin's past relationships, but I'm certainly not in this for the money. I love your son, and that's why we're together. I have no interest in your house. Charlotte then said, Don't worry, Betty. Sometimes it's hard to accept that people can be successful and live in nice houses. You live in a small rented apartment with roommates. You might start desiring it after spending time around our house too. Their comments pushed my patience to the limit, and I was on the verge of losing my temper. Kevin heard everything but chose not to respond or defend himself. 
instead steering the conversation in a different direction. His indifferent attitude on our way home took me by surprise. After a particularly tense visit with his parents, I decided it was crucial to address the issue directly with Kevin. Kevin, your parents are being unfair and hurtful towards both of us. Why didn't you stand up for me? Kevin sighed, his frustration evident. What did you expect me to say, Betty? My past isn't exactly encouraging. I've been used before by people who only saw my parents' wealth, making plans for when they would inherit the house. Even if they were wrong before, that doesn't mean they're wrong about everything. I felt a pang of hurt. Even if those women were after your money, that doesn't mean I am. It hurt that you stayed silent while your family insulted me. Kevin looked conflicted. You know my family is wealthy now, and maybe they have a point. I'm not accusing you of having bad intentions, but I can see why it might look questionable to others. You don't have parents, and because of that, you might seem more reliant on my inheritance. His words were almost too much to bear. What you're suggesting is absurd, Kevin. I've never pressured you to spend on me. Not having an inheritance does not make me a gold digger. Kevin remained stubborn, unwilling to see my perspective. I love you, and that's what matters. Let's not argue about this anymore, he said, dismissing the need for further discussion. While some might have taken comfort in his declaration of love, I couldn't shake the feeling that he still harbored doubts about my intentions. I tried repeatedly to discuss it even suggesting therapy to help him see things more clearly. But he refused, insisting there was nothing wrong. As time went on, I began distancing myself from his family. We got engaged right after I graduated from college, and I landed a decent job which allowed me to start saving for our wedding. We shared the wedding expenses equally and married when I was 23. However, the next four years of our marriage were rocky, Kevin frequently visited his parents, each time returning more distant and upset. I knew Samuel and Charlotte continued to poison his mind, still branding me as a gold digger. Despite my pleas for him to reduce contact with them, Kevin continued to see his parents often. Their negative influence began to deeply affect his view of our relationship, convincing him that no one could truly love him for who he was even after years of my unwavering love. Kevin's suspicion towards me never seemed to ease, and the weight of constantly having to prove my sincerity grew increasingly exhausting. However, the moment that truly tested us came on Kevin's birthday. Preferring a low-key celebration, we decided to have a small cake party at our home. Excited to make his day special, I surprised him with the expensive watch he had long admired. Kevin was thrilled with the gift, but my heart sank when he suggested we show it off to his parents. Despite my hesitation, I went along with him. Upon our arrival, Kevin couldn't wait to show off his new watch to his parents. Mom, Dad, look at this beautiful watch Betty got me. I've wanted it for so long. Isn't it stunning? His enthusiasm was palpable. Charlotte responded with a slight surprise. Oh, Kevin, it seems she does love you after all. We were quite worried for some time. But Samuel quickly added, Don't be fooled, Charlotte. She's a gold digger. She married our son because we have a $350,000 house. Let's not ignore the facts. I couldn't contain my frustration. Excuse me? Why do you think I married your son? For your house? I've been working and living in an apartment for years. Besides, if age was a concern, why would I marry someone older unless I truly loved him? I assure you, I didn't marry Kevin for his money or your house. I married him because I love him. Surely Kevin can confirm that, right? To my astonishment, Kevin remained silent. His reluctance to defend me in front of his accusing parents was deeply unsettling. I felt increasingly isolated as he avoided making eye contact, sinking under their harsh assumptions. Pushed to my limit, I confronted him. Kevin, why aren't you saying anything? Your parents have always labeled me a gold digger. 
How will they ever see the real me if you don't speak up? Why are you so quiet? Tell them they're wrong. Kevin's hesitation was palpable. He muttered, I, I don't know what you want me to say, Betty. Maybe, maybe my parents aren't completely wrong. There might be a possibility that... His words trailed off, but the implication was clear. This doubt, this inability to stand by me, was more than just a simple misunderstanding. It was a fundamental crack in the foundation of our relationship, casting a shadow over our love and my place in his life. In Kevin's birthday celebration, which quickly turned sour, I was astounded by the accusations flying my way. Are you serious right now, Kevin? You believe I married you for your assets? His parents chimed in, their suspicion clear. Oddly, you've never thought about buying a house, isn't it? For someone renting, owning a home should be a top priority. You haven't even talked about it with him. Our place is out of your price range. You could never afford something like this on your own, so marrying Kevin and settling here seems more logical. Kevin looked at me with a mix of doubt and confusion. Yeah, Betty, why would you marry me? You might have feelings for me, but I think there's more to it than just love. I was left speechless by their words. All the love and affection I had felt for Kevin seemed to evaporate in an instant. Both my in-laws and my husband saw me as nothing more than a gold digger. While the skepticism from his parents was hurtful, it was Kevin's agreement that cut the deepest. At that moment, I resolved to end our marriage. I didn't reveal my decision right away. Instead, I waited for the appropriate moment. Once Kevin and I were back home, I contacted a lawyer and began the divorce process. The lawyer assured me that everything would be prepared within a week. Meanwhile, I moved into a separate room, giving myself some space. Kevin thought I was merely cooling off and had no inkling of my intentions. When the divorce papers were ready, I gathered my belongings and left. Kevin, clearly distressed, called me in a panic. I told him to meet me at a specific address and to bring his parents. Despite his confusion, he complied. As they arrived, I stood waiting on the porch of a stunning house. Their expressions shifted to surprise as they took in the scene. You must be wondering why I brought you here, I said, gesturing to the luxurious surroundings. It's a beautiful house, isn't it? No one can compare their home to this one. It's worth around $3 million in today's market. Quite expensive, right? The dramatic setting was my way of showing them that their accusations and suspicions were unfounded. I was not the person they thought I was, and I needed to make that clear in the most unforgettable way. But it's worth every penny, I said, gesturing towards the lavish interior of the house, which also boasted furniture worth millions. What is this place, Betty? I don't understand why you have access to such a house, Kevin asked, puzzled. Why don't you all come in so we can talk properly? I can't explain everything standing here on the porch, I suggested, brushing off their astonishment as I led them inside. They followed, their eyes widening in awe at the opulent decor that greeted us. The owners had spared no expense in furnishing their home. As we settled into the plush sofas, I took a deep breath, ready to address the elephant in the room. I've made a decision, and that's why we're here. I filed for divorce, I stated, handing over the papers. We can proceed with an uncontested divorce if you agree. What? I don't understand. Why are you filing for divorce? Kevin's voice was a mix of confusion and concern. It's simple, I said, my voice steady despite the storm of emotions inside me. You and your parents think I'm a gold digger. You believe I married you for your house and your money. Despite everything I've said, you've refused to listen. So it's better for everyone if I leave, sparing you from what you deem my gold-digging tendencies. You're considering divorce just because my parents spoke what they believe to be the truth? That's ridiculous, Kevin retorted, disbelief coloring his tone. I think it's for the best, I replied, firm in my resolve. His mother, watching the exchange with an unreadable expression, chimed in. If she's so adamant, you should just sign the papers, Kevin. Then, at least you can find someone who truly loves you. Why did you bring us to this house, Betty? Do you expect me to buy this for you as part of our divorce settlement? Kevin asked, suspicion in his voice. Why would I need you to buy this house, Kevin? 
This house is already mine, I answered calmly, watching their shock and disbelief unfold. They looked at me as if I were joking. How on earth can you afford a house like this? You're renting and your job isn't enough to cover something like this. Stop lying to us, Kevin's father demanded, his tone sharp with suspicion. Their disbelief was palpable, but the truth of my independence and financial capability was something I was ready to prove once and for all. This revelation was not just a statement of my financial independence, but also a declaration of my autonomy, forever altering the dynamics of our relationship. I'm not lying, I asserted firmly, seeing the disbelief on their faces. Kevin, remember when I mentioned that my parents left me some inheritance? Well, this house is part of it. It's under a trust for now, but I will officially inherit it when I turn 31. I don't need to work a high-paying job because I have a trust fund waiting for me. That's impossible, Kevin interjected. Your parents passed away a long time ago. They should have given you the house earlier. You see, my parents were aware of the potential leeches I might attract, I explained. So they instructed me never to disclose the house or the trust fund to anyone. Call it foresight, but they knew someone could try to exploit me. Hence, they placed everything in a trust to keep it safe until I reached 31. By then, I'd hopefully be settled with someone who genuinely cared about me, not my inheritance. Oh my God, Betty, you should have told us about your wealth. We had no idea. This is a sizable house you have. We could all live very comfortably here, Kevin's mother exclaimed. Yeah, you should have shared that sooner. We thought you were after our house. We could have avoided all the misunderstandings. Kevin added, looking relieved yet somewhat embarrassed. I always knew Betty was perfect for Kevin. I've been saying she's a great woman. Look how wealthy she is. Kevin found a great match. His father chimed in, his tone shifting dramatically. Hearing this, I couldn't help but laugh. Their attitude toward me had shifted so rapidly it made my head spin. What was even more bizarre was that they seemed to suddenly forget about the divorce papers I had brought. Pulling out the papers, I signed them. As I was saying, here's my signature for an uncontested divorce. You can just sign these to make it easy. If you want to fight, we can take this to court, but I won't live with you anymore. Wait, Betty, listen to me. There's no need to rush this, Kevin pleaded. You've already proven you're not a gold digger. There's no reason to get a divorce anymore. We even apologize for any misunderstanding. That should make things better, right? Yes, Samuel is right. We're sorry, Betty. We doubted you for no reason, his mother added, her voice filled with regret. Despite their apologies and sudden change of heart, the clarity of their initial judgments and accusations lingered in my mind, reinforcing my decision to step away from a relationship where trust had to be proven rather than given. I don't want your insincere apologies, I said firmly, my resolve unwavering. For three years, you allowed your family to berate me and label me a gold digger. I expected you to defend me, but instead, you sided with them and even accused me of the same. I can't stay with someone who doesn't respect his wife. I'm done, Kevin. We can part ways amicably or involve the courts. The choice is yours. Charlotte and Samuel tried desperately to change my mind, pleading with me to overlook the past. In their eyes, what had transpired was just a minor misunderstanding. However, their lack of genuine remorse for tarnishing my reputation only fueled my anger. When I reached my breaking point, I demanded that they leave before I called the police. My firm stance intimidated them, and they left without further argument. Over the next few weeks, Kevin and his parents continued to harass me. They begged, pleaded, and even offered bribes to persuade me to stay. Their belief that money could sway my decision only intensified my fury. It was a stark revelation of their persistent view of me as someone motivated by a financial gain. Ironically, since Kevin co-owned the house with his parents, I was entitled to half of his share, which only fueled their desperation for reconciliation. Despite their relentless attempts, I remained steadfast in my decision to part ways. I relocated all my belongings to my parents' house, asserting my right to stay there even before officially taking ownership. 
Kevin and his parents persisted in their attempts to reach out, prompting me to change my phone number to avoid their constant calls from unfamiliar numbers. Kevin even attempted to discuss matters at my workplace, but I had informed security beforehand, and they asked him to leave. Kevin still hadn't signed the divorce papers, holding out hope for a change in my decision. Nearly a year has passed, and yet the situation remains unresolved, a testament to the complexity and emotional depth of our entangled lives. Since I initiated the divorce proceedings, with less than a year remaining until the legal process is concluded, I've managed quite well on my own. Living independently, I've found both happiness and financial stability. While I've gone on a few dates, I'm not considering anything serious at the moment. According to a cousin of Kevin's, his family is now worried about having to pay me my rightful share of the house. The legal fees are mounting and their savings are proving to be insufficient. Kevin is even advocating for selling the house, harboring resentment toward his parents for the upheaval they've caused in his life. At this point, I simply don't care about their dilemmas. My only goal is to be free from that toxic family and move on with my life, leaving the chaos and negativity behind.